I'm going to let you in on an open secret. I have no talent in mixing music or t-shirt design. I cannot do an English accent, Irish accent, or Afrikaans accent to save my life. Nor do I have the vocal range to give you the deep-voiced opening you hear at the start of each episode. The good news for me is there is always Fiverr. Fiverr.com allows you to hire freelancers for sometimes as little as $5 to do tasks that you have to get done for your business or sing happy birthday to your spouse in ways that are impossible for you or honestly, the list could go on. Help yourself and help the show by using the link I provide in the show notes to see if Fiverr's freelancers can help you or if you have anything to offer Fiverr. My show was not possible without Fiverr. Some meaningful work in your life may now become possible with Fiverr. Go ahead and open the link in our show notes right now. Now, on to our show. This is Forgotten Wars. British infantryman Gunnar Net Lee walked a funny path into British ranks. Gunnar Net Lee's father was a farm worker in Polborough, Sussex. Gunnar and his four brothers followed their father's footsteps until all five were laid off by the local farmer. Gunnar had enough sense of humor to tell his fellow infantrymen that his former boss was the best recruiting sergeant that the British Army ever had. You see, after that farmer laid all five Net Lee brothers off, all five brothers joined the British Armed Forces. Gunner embodied the ideal British private. He showed good humor instead of fear in times of great danger. Net Lee wrote the following in his diary just three nights after the British won a tactical victory at Talana Hill. Quote, In the dead of night, we are on the move. Strict orders against striking matches and no talking allowed. I would not have minded the talking part of the business being stopped, but to have to go without a smoke puts my pipe properly out. Of course, it was the correct thing to do, as a light would have shown the wars what we were up to. End quote. Pakenham continues to set the scene, writing, quote, What we are up to, what indeed? It was a question to which Net Lee's own officers and Major General James Ewell himself, Simmons's replacement, would have dearly liked an answer to. It was Sunday night, the third night after the victory at Talana Hill, and Ewell's four infantry battalions looked anything but victors. There they lay, not even daring to light a fire, no tents, not even blankets or ground sheets for some, on the stony hillside south of the town of Dundee. Officers, as well as men, were huddled up in great coats against the freezing rain, and invisible above them in the midst of Mount Impati, commanding every movement they made on their side of the valley, tossing a six-inch shell from time to time across the intervening four miles of space, was a thirty-foot-long steel prodigy, one of Yobert's new creosote siege guns, a long tom. End quote. A long tom and other war artillery had earlier bombed the British military hospital, holding the dying General Penn Simmons. This despite the International Red Cross flag flying over the hospital. This Red Cross flag symbolized the internationally recognized and recently signed Geneva Convention. Yet, The 18th Field Hospital witnessed scores of wounded men, some of them dragging themselves on broken legs, trying desperately to flee Dundee, where this hospital was situated. General Ewell was a bit of a wreck. Simmonson's death thrust Ewell into a command position that he was ill-suited for. Ewell's morale was down after the costly victory at Talana Hill, dipped further when White refused him reinforcements the morning of the Battle of Elon's Lochter, then spiked after hearing news of British victory 
at Elon's Lakhter. Yul moved his troops to try to catch Buors retreating from Elon's Lakhter, but ended up chasing ghosts. Then Yul considered digging in at Talana Hill, thinking he would dig in and try to outlast the Buors. His officers talked him out of this, urging him towards the only way out of the situation in their view, to fight their way out of the Boer noose around their necks. Just an hour after Yule, with a heavy heart, agreed with his officers, General White wired Yule the following message. I cannot reinforce you without sacrificing Lady Smith and the colony behind. You must try and fall back on Lady Smith. Pakenham writes, quote, If Yule was relieved at White's taking the responsibility, the decision to retreat was still intensely humiliating. Since the days of the Peninsular War, there was hardly a precedent for this. Just a month before, White had decided that the political risks of peacefully withdrawing Simmons's force from Dundee were too great to balance the military advantages. Now, throwing those political arguments to the wind, White was ordering Yule to leave to the enemy not only the town of Dundee, but the garrison's two-month supply of food and stores, and also to abandon their own wounded officers and men, including Simmons, end quote. As Yule led Gunner Netley and other troops on a march through constant rain and mist out of Dundee, only the officers knew that they were retreating to Lady Smith, not to dig in at Talana Hill. Boer forces bombed what was left of British forces into submission at Dundee. Then the Boers focused on looting Dundee rather than chasing Yule's force. Amid the looting, Boers discovered something unexpected. Simmonson's code books, as well as his copy of the British War Office's secret handbook, Military Notes. General Penn Simmons died in the midst of all the looting of Dundee. Simmons died repeating over and over again, quote, Tell everyone I died facing the enemy. Tell everyone I died facing the enemy. End quote. Boer General Don Yell Erasmus visited the hospital the next morning to pay his respects to Simmons. Erasmus asked if he could see the dead general's face. Major Karen granted General Erasmus permission and raised the sheet covering Simmons's face. It is a pity, this war, said Erasmus. Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire, but that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks, act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. General White did not want to be besieged at Lady Smith. This was no place to choose to hold yourself up in. This was the place to catch typhoid fever if you wanted to. Hills surrounded Lady Smith, hills perfect for besiegers to sit. Buller made it repetitively clear that White needed to avoid being besieged as he prepared the way for Buller's force to retake Natal but Dundee was also a similarly terrible place to defend, hence why Yule eventually retreated from that town to, ironically, another town that would be a terrible place to defend. Instead of executing a fighting retreat by moving south along the railway line from Lady Smith, White wanted a knockout blow. For the previous 50 years, British generals had managed to strike knockout blows after initial defeats in various small wars in India and Africa. These British forces didn't use nuanced strategy or tactics in these wars. 
at least according to Pakenham. Getting all the troops and supplies in the right place might take months, but British generals time and time again could deliver knockout blows in a matter of hours, in just a day's battle. White reportedly knew his force was far weaker than Yobert's invading force, and that his force would be useless to save Natal from a full war invasion if his force were trapped in Lady Smith. Yet, White would not show any weakness by making a fighting retreat, so instead, White vacillated as he tried to find the unlikely opportunity to deliver Yobert's forces a knockout blow. Ian Hamilton's scouts found an opportunity to strike the Boer's main lahar, which lay barely defended. On October 27th, Hamilton begged General White for the opportunity to make a 1 a.m. strike on this lahar. White agreed. Then two hours before Hamilton would lead the attack, White vacillated, calling off the attack. Hamilton must have felt a sense of deja vu, another general above him, refusing to take needed initiative in Natal, just like his brother-in-law, General Kale, had in the First Boer War. Then White hatched a plan to attack a large Boer contingent on Saturday. But White's plan was so stupid that most of his officers, including Hamilton, opposed White's plan. But White was panicking. The Boers had recently cut off Lady Smith's water supply. White thought this might be the final chance to break out and deliver a knockout blow. What you are about to hear is an account of the eve and the day that the British refer to as Mournful Monday. The battles of Modder Sprite and Nicholson's Neck made Monday, October 30th, a mournful day for the British. The British refer to the battles fought on this day as the Battle of Ladysmith. Lieutenant General George White believed that a war attack on Lady Smith was imminent unless he could deliver a demoralizing blow to war forces currently drawing a noose around Lady Smith. So White chose Monday, October 30th to deliver this blow. The plan? To bomb the war position at Long Hill, situated northeast of Lady Smith, then flank that position from the south with some infantry led by Colonel C.G. Grimwood. General Yule reported sick earlier, so Colonel Grimwood had to take Yule's place. Major General French had to cover this attack with contingents of mounted troops. Once the British took Long Hill, Colonel Grimwood and Major General Ian Hamilton were to take an array of infantry, mounted troops, and cavalry to storm the main war position at Pepworth Hill. Then, Hamilton's mounted troops would pursue retreating Boers toward Nicholson's Neck. British reconnaissance reported a small contingent of free state troops near Nicholson's Neck. So, White caused the most concern among his staff officers by sending Colonel F.R.C. Carleton through Boer lines with a column to hold Nicholson's Neck or something of tactical importance nearby. Colonel Carleton's force came with no mounted troops. So two of the main British objectives, take Long Hill and then Pepworth Hill. But White's plan provided little flexibility, little accounting for adjustments made by the Boers. Pakenham compared the plan to a rigid sequence of chess moves planned without accounting at all for an opponent's counter moves. At about 11.30 p.m. on Sunday, Colonel Carleton's column marched to take its place at Nicholson's Neck, behind enemy lines. Carleton's column left later than they'd planned because they didn't load their ammunition from the ordnance store soon enough. An hour later, Colonel Grimwood and General Hamilton led their contingents toward their respective positions. General White woke up at 3 a.m. on that mournful Monday to personally lead his own regiment, the dear old 92nd. Little time passed before bad news reached White's staff officer. A nervous soldier from Carlton's column came back to report that some of Carlton's pack mules stampeded away. 
carrying guns and spare ammunition. Would the vacillating General White make any adjustments? No. General White made no adjustments to his attack plans when he heard of the oxen stampede. General Pete Yobert and his officers commanded 7,500 troops north of Lady Smith. Several hundred of those troops included the Irish Brigade, commanded by the American Colonel John Blake. Before it goes behind a paywall a couple weeks after this episode release, you can read more about this Irish Transvaal Brigade that clashed several times with British-Irish regiments. Check out the blog section of our ForgottenWars.com site. If you listen to this episode a few weeks or more after this episode's release and want to read the article that I wrote about this Irish brigade, consider supporting us on Patreon to get access to all the articles I've written for Forgotten Wars. The night before Mournful Monday, Yobert withdrew wars originally on Long Hill to a position behind Modder Sprite further east. This proved a brilliant, deadly stroke. But why? Because General White didn't know about this withdrawal. So instead of a British contingent going around the left flank of the Boers thought to be at Long Hill, that British contingent instead unwittingly moved forward and then turned inward in front of the new Boer position near Modder Sprite. Colonel Grimwood led his contingent of British infantry out of Ladysmith on a course for Long Hill that eve of Mournful Monday. For some reason, an artillery division of Grimwood's force marched only half of the way that White's plan prescribed, and then took up a totally different position while also keeping the Liverpools, Dublin Fusiliers, and some mounted infantry companies. Colonel Grimwood and his three battalions who were leading the way for this operation did not know about this freelancing some of his artillery, infantry, and mounted men had engaged in, until shortly before the sunrise the next day, mournful Monday. Boers fired their rifles and two artillery pieces from their new position near Modder Sprite. This must have been a rude awakening for Colonel Grimwood. Two hours later, some British artillery moved up to shell the Boer artillery into silence, at least for a time. When the British realized that the main Boer artillery sat on Pepworth Hill, not Long Hill, an artillery duel broke out, with the Boers moving their artillery around to great effect. Instead of getting out to Colonel Grimwood's right before sunrise, and then sweeping the Boers northward, according to plan, French's cavalry faced Boers directly across Modder Sprite. The clash saw bullets fly so much the French's men had to keep their heads down for far more than they'd planned. General Lucas Mayer led his 2,000-man section of wars until he collapsed. Mayer fell ill for not only the rest of the day, but for the rest of the war. Who had to fill his shoes? Louis Bouta. At 11.30 a.m., General White made another mistake. When White heard unverified reports that the Boers were going to attack Ladysmith from the west, White ordered a withdrawal to Ladysmith. This order fueled even more confusion within his force, leaving Colonel Grimwood in a terrible position at Modersprite and Colonel Carleton in a terrible position at Nicholson's Neck. As Grimwood's men retreated across a long, almost entirely flat plain towards Ladysmith, the Boers lit Grimwood's men up until British 13th and 21st batteries directed their fire at the oncoming Boers to successfully cover the disorderly retreat of the British infantry and cavalry. Yobert again failed to take aggressive initiative to counter the British batteries and round up the retreating British. Yobert instead continued to fire artillery at retreating Brits. Denise writes, remembers Yobert's failure with great frustration. He knew Yobert had more than enough horsemen to unleash on the retreating British. Wrights remembers this in his book Commando. Quote, I heard Christian de Vette mutter, loose your horsemen, loose your horsemen. 
but the Commandant General allowed this wonderful opportunity to go by, a failure that cost us dear in the days to come. Judging by the disorderly appearance of the retreat, he could have driven the English clean through Ladysmith and out beyond, and he would have lost fewer men in the doing of it than we lost in the subsequent siege. But the English went hurrying back unmolested, save for an occasional shell from Pepworth Hill. End quote. The HMS Powerful showed up on the Natawa coast just in the nick of time, the morning of October 30th. This ship's naval brigade trained its long-range artillery guns on the Boer position at Pepworth, from 6,500 yards away. The HMF Powerful's guns silenced the Long Tom and other Boer artillery that rained down on retreating British. Meanwhile, more mayhem met the British at Lombard's Neck near Modder Sprite, where Louis Boita filled Lucas Mayer's shoes by continuing to outflank British forces and keeping up fierce fire that French and his force continued to keep their heads down. Remember, these British troops had hoped to flank the Boers, but instead, the Boers caught the British out of position. Maybe the most mayhem ensued in the most ill-advised element of White's original plan, the plan to shoot Carleton's column through Boer lines to Nicholson's neck. Now remember that oxen stampede that we mentioned earlier? We don't know for certain, 120 years later, why this oxen stampede started. Historian Franz Johann Praetorius wonders if it was an alarm raised by a Boer sentry, or even rocks accidentally being dislodged as the column marched at an incline. What we do know is that something caused the Irish fusiliers and the mules dragging the ammo wagons to panic. Praetorius writes, quote, Startled, a number of fusiliers started running back down the hill followed by a stampede of mules with their precious freight. The mules disappeared into the darkness, but after some considerable effort, the officers succeeded in getting the men under control. At about 3 a.m., they reassembled on the summit of Kayangubo. Their artillery guns rendered useless by missing screw gun parts that had been packed on the mule wagons. Most of the reserve rifle ammunition was lost, and many men were missing. Some of those men arrived at Ladysmith later in the morning. Not only did Carlton's column lose some guns and ammo en route to Nicholson's Neck, but the stampede also helped the Boers pinpoint where Carlton's forces were. Not only did Carlton's forces betray their position, but they also chose the wrong position. Why? Remember when we said a couple minutes ago that Carlton's column departed behind schedule? Because of this delay, Carlton and Major Adya decided around 2 a.m., nearly three hours into their march, that they were not going to make it to Nicholson's Neck before daybreak. So Carlton and Adya set their sights on the closer Kayangubo Hill, situated alongside Nicholson's Neck. This Kayangubo Hill was far less defensible than Nicholson's Neck. The Carlton Column's calamities were far from finished. The Carlton Column didn't cover the northern side of the hill, which had plenty of dead ground. The ample dead ground on the north side of Kayangubo Hill offered plenty of cover for Boers under the command of Christian de Vett and GMG Von Dam to crawl undetected and then rush stone to stone with few casualties when the British finally did see them coming. But both Devet and Fawn Dam did sustain wounds during this advance. By 8.30 a.m., it was clear as day that the Boers meant to attack the Carlton Column mainly from the north. But the British shifted hardly anyone to account for this. Boers closed within 200 yards from the south as well and collaborated to create a deadly crossfire against the defending British. Some British started to retreat by mistake or panic. Then, when Carleton shifted half of a company to a different part of the perimeter, other British troops thought a general retreat was on and started a chaotic stampede down the hill. 
granting the Boers ample opportunity to pick them off as they fled. When some of Carlton's men started to raise the white flag without his permission at around 1.15 p.m., Carlton knew the game was up and gave official sanction to surrender. If you would like to help keep Forgotten Wars producing and growing, would you do at least two of three things? First, would you share a link to the podcast with someone you think might enjoy it? Second, if you're listening on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or other providers, would you make sure to like or follow our podcast? If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, would you give us a five-star rating and write a thoughtful review there? You can even do that while you're listening. Lastly, if you want more from the show, bonus episodes, behind-the-mic access, transcripts and sources, and much more, and you want to support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Forgotten Wars. That is patreon.com slash Forgotten Wars. The link is also in this episode's notes. Thanks to those of you who have done one of these things already. Know that you're appreciated. Now, back to our episode. African servants of the Boers tug Carlton, and between 900 and 1300, depending on who you ask, new prisoners of war across Boer lines. The African servants were wearing kilts, kilts stripped from the Gordon Highlanders who died at Elon's Lochter. The British suffered between 300 and 500 killed and wounded, depending on who you ask. Historian J.H. Breitenbach reports that the Boers lost less than 100 killed and wounded. The British who survived their retreats were not a pretty sight. The Chronicle's Henry Nevison writes, quote, They came back slowly, tired and disheartened and sick with useless losses. As soon as they were out of range, the men wandered away in groups to the town, sick and angry but longing above all things for water and sleep, end quote. Some of these men had already marched for four days under Major General Yule from Dundee to Lady Smith, sleep-deprived, demoralized. Even French's cavalry, who had triumphed at Elon's Lochter, returned from this battle as, quote, a seething mass of clubbed and broken cavalry, according to at least one account. Another historian dubbed this day as one of the gloomiest days in the history of the British Army. Pakenham called Mournful Monday the most humiliating day in British military history since Machuba. The Battle of Ladysmith broke General George White. All of his plans had backfired. Pakenham writes that White had, quote, planned to roll up the Boers from the right. Instead, he had himself been rolled back into Lady Smith. The humiliation seemed total. It was the first time in the war that two large bodies of troops had met on apparently equal terms. Man for man, general for general. The British were no match for the Boers. The knockdown blow had fallen on White himself, as he put it. He sent a brief cable to the war office. It was my plan, and I take full responsibility. Then he wrote a long, abject letter to his wife. At 64, he was too old for soldiering. His troops had lost confidence in him. He would be superseded, and rightly. End quote. But the Boers did not immediately cut off Lady Smith from the rest of the world. It was not too late for White to lead a fighting retreat south and to burn all the surplus supplies in Lady Smith. But, who knows if White's troops would have even listened to such an order. So White went nowhere. That Thursday, November 2nd at 2.30 p.m., Lady Smith's telegraph line went dead. The railway line severed. The Boers began besieging Lady Smith. This, too, would prove to be a grave mistake. I'd also like to remind you of this month's ongoing contest. If you would like to win your choice of either John Morley's vintage two-volume biography on William Gladstone, 
a brand new copy of Prescott Holmes's biography of Paul Creer, a used copy I ordered of Robert Rotberg's biography of Cecil Rhodes, a brand new copy of Denis Reitz's Commando, a journal of the Boer War, or a used copy I ordered of Ian Smith's Origins of the South African War, then here is what I ask. Share the Forgotten Wars podcast with others. Make that share personalized and authentic from you. Then, send me a picture of people responding to your share. That could be a picture of people thanking you for the share on Messenger, a picture of people liking and or commenting on your share of the show on Facebook, someone telling you in an email that they will check the podcast out, etc. One lucky person will have their choice of one of these books. The person with the most people responding to their sharing of the podcast will have first pick. This contest will run through March 2021 with winners announced immediately after. Thanks for listening.